Ladies and gentlemen, our program will begin in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, our program will begin in just a moment. Good day. Welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, powered by AJC. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. Today's program is brought to you in partnership with Jewish Insider. You can sign up for Jewish Insider's daily kickoff by visiting www.jewishinsider.com. We are delighted to be joined today by His Excellency Archbishop Paul Gallagher, Vatican Secretary of Relations Between States, its Foreign Minister, and Rabbi David Rosen, AJC's International Director for Interreligious Affairs. After witnessing the absolute evil of the Shoah, the Vatican initiated a total turnabout and rebirth of relations with Jews and Judaism in the 1960s. AJC, an active partner in this accelerated process of reconciliation, was the first American Jewish organization to have been granted a papal audience in the post-Vatican II era and continues to enjoy private papal audiences. Today, new heights of cooperation and solidarity based on common values have been reached. This conversation, touching on anti-Semitism, Israel, the Middle East, and more, will be moderated by Lisa Palmieri Billig, AJC representative in Italy and liaison to the Holy See. After we hear from Lisa and our esteemed guest, we will take your questions. You may email your question to questions at ajc.org, that's questions plural, or use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Lisa, you and our esteemed guests have the floor. Thank you very much, Daniel. So a big welcome to uh, Your Excellency Archbishop Gallagher and to my colleague David, Rabbi David Rosen. We are delighted and honored to have both of you with us today. And we are looking forward to hearing your expert and inside views on the issues and that are particularly important and relevant for our very special relationships, those between Catholics and Jews and between the Holy See and Israel. You have both played significant roles in various capacities in world diplomacy for peace, and in particular the interreligious aspect, with special regard for the Middle East. Archbishop Gallagher, you have served in Tanzania, Uruguay, the Philippines, Burundi, Australia, and the Council of Europe before becoming the Holy See's foreign minister, as we call you, and overseeing the final agreement between the Holy See and the Palestinian Authority. While you, Rabbi David Rosen, in addition to all the multiple roles you have played and are still playing regarding relations with all the world's religions, your and AJC's relations with the Vatican have a long history. You are the only Israeli and first Orthodox rabbi to be knighted by the Pope and were the single Jewish representative invited to address the Holy See Synod on the Middle East regarding the future of Christianity in the region. As a member of the Vatican-Israel Bilateral Commission, you participated in years of preparatory talks and in the drafting of the agreement that ushered in diplomatic relations between the two states in 1993. The preamble to this fundamental agreement is based on a very special premise, that of being, I quote, aware of the unique nature of the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Jewish people, and of the historic process of reconciliation and the growth in mutual understanding and friendship between Catholics and Jews. Article 2 commits both states to, I quote, appropriate cooperation in combating all forms of anti-Semitism, and goes on to specify the whole sees cond condemnation, and I quote again, of hatred, persecution, and all manifestations of anti-Semitism directed against the Jewish people and individual Jews anywhere, at any time, and by anyone. All post-Vatican popes, and Francis in particular, have repeatedly condemned anti-Semitism. John Paul II called it a sin against God and against man. Francis said many times that a Christian cannot be an anti-Semite, and yet, anti-Semitism is resurging all over the world. Present methods for combating this evil seem not to be working. So therefore, my first question to you both is, 
What do you suggest could be a new, more effective joint strategy for combating anti-Semitism, committed anywhere at any time and by anyone, even by non-Christians and religious extremists or fanatics of all sorts? Um, Archbishop uh, Gallagher, I give you the first word. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And it's a pleasure to participate in this exchange uh, this afternoon. Um, you're right, the uh, climate uh, regarding anti-Semitism is sadly um, getting worse. We, we, we have statistics to base that up, we have examples of it, and at the, at the same time we know that there is much work to be done. Um, I think we have to recognize that um, we're passing in a moment of um, great conflict in the world, rising tensions on all sorts of political fronts, and including in particular, obviously, the Middle East, the conflicts in Syria, difficulties in Iraq, and now a, a crisis also in, in Lebanon. And all of this is creating an atmosphere in which um, many discriminations and many prejudices will probably continue to thrive. And so we have to, in some ways, uh, while rejecting it, also accept that that, that is our, our point of departure and we have to work at it. And we certainly know within the, the Catholic Church that you, in some ways, can't let your guard down. Uh, commitments by ecumenical councils, by popes, and other church leaders is not the whole story. And we need an awful lot of work at the ground root level to change hearts, to open up people. And the, although, as you mentioned, there have been growing understanding and uh, affection and cooperation between the various popes since uh, Vatican II, and also uh, at also many, many other levels. We do have to recognize that there is also a great deal of ignorance and, a great, and many uh, ideas going around which, which are seedbeds for prejudice. And so I think we have to begin many ways with our, our young people. Education is, is, I think, key. Combating ignorance, which there is, we have to recognize in all of ourselves, uh, I speak, I speak for myself in the, in the saying, although I grew up in uh, a city in the UK with a, a then strong Jewish community, I didn't really get to know that Jewish community and I didn't get to know an awful lot of their beliefs and traditions. And so I've still got work to be, to be doing that. So I think we have to work with our, with our young people. I think we have to try and uh, make sure that uh, religious programs and religious curricula reflect that commitment of the church to combating uh, uh, anti-Semitism and improving uh, relations and understanding and friendship uh, with uh, Jewish communities and with individual Jews uh, throughout the world. So we've got to do work on that, we've got to have formation. We probably have to work also in formation of the clergy and other things that, uh, of that kind in what our, our uh, young, uh, priests and religious are, are sensitive to. So I think there's that. And I think also we obviously have to then work also on the things that we've done, the agreements that have been established between uh, the Holy See and uh, the State of Israel, the agreements which are made with um, Jewish organizations throughout the world, making those uh, agreements ever more realistic, ever more practical and uh, fulfilling their, their potential. And we continue to, to dialogue with the uh, government of the State of Israel on, on the basis of our fundamental agreement and to bring it to a, a, a beneficial uh, conclusion for both parties. And we uh, continue obviously to have uh, interreligious dialogue. And I think that that is something that does uh, need to be, be deepened in all its dimensions, particularly the uh, aspects of uh, 
biblical understanding and and also fraternal uh, dialogue these are these are the instruments that we have available to us but uh, we have to uh, continue to do that we do have here in as part of the Pontifical Council for Unity of Christians we have a uh, also a department which deals with relations with the Jews we have a person who represents also us of the Secretary of State, Father Norbert Hoffman, who is well known to many uh, Jewish leaders and many uh, leaders in Israel as well. So we, we're try, we try to get the thing, but there is enormous potential for, for uh, the, this thing. But I think in, in some ways, we have to, in these difficult times, redouble our efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have a comment on that? <clears throat> but, well, obviously, allow me to open by or adding my thanks to Archbishop Gallagher for his graciousness in participating in this discussion. Um, I'm not sure whether that's ever happened ever before on the part of a Jewish organization with the um, person responsible for relations with states, the foreign minister of the Vatican, and we are very grateful for it. So obviously, I echo everything he has said. But in, to some extent, there's the rub, because as you mentioned, Lisa, Article 2 commits the Holy See and the State of Israel to work together and joint action to combat anti-Semitism. I do not know of any joint action that has been taken. And I would find it difficult to believe that this has never been raised by Israeli ambassadors and representatives at the Holy See. It seems to me this is something which if we are serious, we need to take um, with far greater gravity. And I would simply make some obvious suggestion. Uh, there, um, there are the network, the diplomatic service of the Holy See is if not the oldest, uh, certainly one of them in the world. You have nunciatures, embassies around the world. I think it should be not too difficult a thing to give direction to those nuncios, those ambassadors, to be able to reach out to the local Jewish communities, to be able to do a program, whether it's on the anniversary of the signing of the fundamental agreement, or on the day that the Holy See has appointed as a day of Judaism, but is not actually necessarily taken up by all the bishops' conferences, to be a little more assertive in that regard and to encourage them to actually do programs that will raise the problem of anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism, that will highlight the Catholic Church's wonderful uh, transformation and therefore be active in terms of changing attitudes and not purely responsive to particular difficulties and challenges when they occur. Thank well, you. Uh, may, may I just make a, a, a comment on uh, Rabbi David's remarks? Certainly. No, well, I, I entirely agree that, the, uh, that, uh, that we could do more at the level of cooperation uh, between the um, uh, State of Israel and the Holy See through the nunciatures and through the embassies. Yes, it's true. But I, I would comment that in my own personal experience, before uh, I became the nuncio in Burundi. I was the representative of the Holy See to the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, in, in Alsace. And there, there was a very strong Jewish community. And uh, I think I used to go to synagogue on average about once every, every two months for some, some event. In fact, I wore a, a, a skull cap in, in my life uh, in, in the synagogue long before I wore it as a Catholic bishop. And uh, there, there was a also, uh, even to this day, I think he, he's, he's still there, he was when I last visited, an excellent uh, honorary consul who worked very closely with our mission, was a great friend of our mission. And uh, together with the chief uh, rabbi of Strasbourg, we, we did uh, many, many, many things in common. Also, when I was in, in, in Guatemala, which is a very significant place for the history of uh, the uh, state of Israel, because it was the Guatemalan vote which gained uh, the approval of the State of Israel by the United Nations. So the community there was very, very strong, very active, and we were uh, always uh, participating in their events and uh, with them. I think it's true in, in Guatemala, for example, we could have done more on, in terms of dialogue and uh, joint programs 
uh, but um, I, I think that the situation is at the local level is often somewhat un underrated, but maybe we need to give also some uh, greater leadership uh, from the top. Thank you very much. Of course, this will go on and on, and uh, also the problem of people who are not directly associated with the Catholic Church and whom we need to somehow or other involve in this discussion. But uh, it, it's a long discussion, and we have very little time and loads of questions here. Um, uh, we, I wanted to ask about <clears throat> why the Vatican has not yet accepted the uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's working definition of anti-Semitism. And I, in this respect, I wanted to ask David what it's important is and why it's important to, uh, for governments to adopt it. So my first question is to you, uh, Your Excellency, uh, why, what is holding back the Vatican's acceptance of this? Well, um, I think that, as, as you mentioned your, yourself in your opening remarks, our commitment both uh, institutionally and personally at many levels within the church, I think is, is not in doubt. We are very committed to combating and to uh, uh, fighting anti-Semitism. Um, we don't really see uh, why in the, in, the, in, in the view in that case, we should make f a further commitment to a definition. I think definitions are, by, are always limited. I think that they, uh, this is my personal view, I, I will say, the definitions tend to be either too loose or too restrictive and therefore sometimes not helpful. It's true that you're talking about a, a working uh, definition here, but um, I, I think that, that, that uh, we are a little uh, hesitant to um, commit ourselves to uh, something which then can be, uh, which in itself, as we say, is, is something which is, is often is changing from generation to generation, is expressing itself in different ways. And I think to bind yourself uh, to, to a definition may not be helpful and may not be uh, in our best interest in the end. David? <laughs> So the challenge, one of the challenges of combating anti-Semitism is the people's attempt to avoid the admission of the poison that they are purveying. And people will say, you know, I'm not an anti-Semite, I just don't like that, or this is not an anti-Semitic comment. And we can differ as to what is anti-Semitism and what isn't anti-Semitism. So there is a need for a definition in order to be able to pursue and to prosecute these actions against the Jewish community and against their well-being. Definition enables us to do that. Um, it, it also enables you then to legislate for appropriate punitive action, like losing state funding, facing possible legal penalties. It also enables you to be able to define actions which could be more generalized. So one of the things within the working definition is the stigmatization of the Jewish people, conspiracy theories. We've seen with COVID, the purveying mm. of conspiracy theories, targeting Jews, etc. cetera. A definition enables you to be able to address those actions and not simply tut tut and say, well, there's nothing we can do about it. So it's a very important tool. And also a tool, even though there's some controversy around it, nevertheless, with regards to identifying the fact that Israel is very often uh, a cover for anti-Semitic uh, expression, that's important to say that as well. It doesn't say you can't criticize the state of Israel, but it says that to be able to target Israel as a Jewish collectivity, in other words, saying Israel doesn't have a right to exist, should be seen as what it is, denying the Jews what you would allow anybody else to have, and should be defined and stigmatized appropriately as anti-Semitism. Thank you. Now, in the ongoing remarkable process of reconciliation between the Catholic Church and the Jewish people, are there still some outstanding issues that have not yet been fully confronted? Archbishop Gallagher and then Rabbi Rosen. Well, uh, I, I'm sure that the, the, there are many things on which we, we, need, to, we need to work um, still. Um, many of, uh, I think, what uh, Rabbi David was, was talking about is obviously that within our own communities, 
there would be uh, many who would, would not necessarily embrace uh, it completely uh, the formal position of the church. And so we need, we need to work on that. Um, we also need to try and, um, well, we need to conclude all the, the uh, negotiations with the State of Israel and the Holy See uh, to the benefit of both parties and in particular of the uh, Christian uh, churches uh, and the Catholic communities in, in Israel. And, uh, and so we, we, have, we, have, we still have obviously a lot of issues to, to work on. I think that the, the great document, Nostra Etate, which rec represents the, the sea change in our relations in the last century, is, is something we need to take up again, uh, to read again, and to see uh, exactly what uh, the fathers of the Second Vatican Council committed the church to, and uh, see where we have neglected some, some of those, uh, those aspects as well. Thank you. I think uh, that actually Archbishop Gallagher in a previous response highlighted the biggest challenge. Uh, there are of course things on which we are not going to agree. Obviously, theologically, we don't have identical viewpoints. We are different religions. We also have different historical memories and therefore our relationship to history is going to be different. These are things we need to respect in each other. But I think the biggest lacuna, the biggest Thing that's been missing is that while there's been this amazing, blessed transformation on the Olympian Heights, as it were, in terms of the magisterium, the teaching of the popes and the official documents of the church, it hasn't always been translated into the grassroots everywhere in the world. And the biggest omission, I think, is that which Archbishop Gallagher referred to before, and that is the question of formation. If you are really serious about this transformation, this relationship, and you're committed as Nostra Aetate indicates and as the guidelines on Nostra Aetate and the notes on the preaching and teaching on Judaism, and Judaism in catechesis are saying that we wish to have that full relationship at which people understand within the church their Jewish roots and their relationship to the Jewish people, then it needs to be an essential required part of the formation of priests in terms of their syllabus everywhere. And I'm afraid that isn't the case. I travel the world and I even meet bishops, let alone priests who don't even know the content of Nostra Aetate. And I know their documents better than they do. Well, of course, that's my business, if you like. That's my vocation. But nevertheless, there should be a much higher level of no and deeper level of knowledge of the actual teachings of the church in relation to Jews, Judaism and Israel than there is at the moment. Yes, okay. I, I think, we, I think uh, one aspect we have to... Uh, be aware of in, the, in that in the last two, uh, three pontificates, shall we say, but particularly with John Paul II and with Pope Francis, they had personal deep friendships and relations with Jewish communities and with Jewish individuals, which formed the basis of their commitment to carrying forward uh, the work of Nostra Aetate and of the Council with regard to Christian Jewish relations. And I don't think we should ever take that for granted, because uh, as we were, we were saying that, you know, that, that there is a danger that what has been achieved could be relatively superficial. I too was very um, struck by listening to uh, British radio uh, week, weekend before last, in where a spokesperson person for the Jewish community in the United Kingdom was saying that, that there were, were people who were uh, attributing part of the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis uh, to, uh, again, a Jewish conspiracy. And I, I was really shocked at that because, frankly, I didn't think that, that could possibly happen in 2020. But it's an indication of how much there is to be work to be done. But obviously, work to be done at the grassroots level and with the, the education of our young people and the formation of our of clergy and religious. Thank you. Thank you. Let me turn to a moment since we have time. I'd like to turn to the topic of Jerusalem, uh, the safeguarding of the holy city with three to its holy places is one of the key issues of a, a future peace treaty between Israelis and Palestinians that we hope will come about soon. 
The Holy See no longer demands a corpus separatum for Jerusalem, but it does call for a separate international statute for the city, in addition to requesting maintaining the status quo. So Archbishop Gallagher, first I'll ask you, uh, given that the Holy See today has diplomatic agreements and full relations with both Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Why is such an international statute necessary? And to whom is it really directed? And then shortly afterwards, <laughs> ask David, what is yeah. the situation of Christians in Israel today? And what is the state of diplomatic relations between Israel and the Holy See? Well, we, we covered that a little bit before, but perhaps you'd like to say a few more words. Thank you. Well, the um, you, there's questions regarding to the uh, final status of Jerusalem um, forms part of the shall we say classic uh, approach of the Holy See uh, to uh, the question. Um, we believe that the multi-religious character and the uh, spiritual dimension uh, and the particular cultural identity of Jerusalem, which are all so rich and so important for all of humanity, but in particular, obviously, for the monotheistic religions of Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, that the way uh, to assure the identity of this wonderful, amazing uh, city um, is in, would be, in fact, some uh, international guaranteed uh, status, which obviously where we, the appeal is directed to mainly to the international community in general and the United Nations, who, who hopefully would eventually be the guarantor of this, but obviously also to Israelis and Palestines in the direct negotiations, which we never cease uh, to, to encourage. And uh, so the Holy Father has, I think, you know, in, in, in recent years, but particularly when he made the uh, declaration statement last year with uh, King Mohammed VI of Morocco, that there is a special spiritual significance, a special vocation for the great city of, of peace uh, for the whole of the world. So we feel it's something that has to have a much wider dimension than uh, possibly is, is, is being uh, proposed at, at this time. Um, and that we need to, uh, to work on that in, in seeing the future agreements, hopefully, which will come about between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, I might uh, add uh, that I, I imagine, uh, and uh, Archbishop Gallagher can obviously say whether my imagining is correct or not, that there is also an, the, a need and desire on the part of the Holy See to be able to emphasize uh, in some form of international framework that that spiritual nature of Jerusalem that is not simply a diplomatic one, and therefore you have diplomatic agreements, but there need to be able to emphasize the three particular religious traditions. And I think that's important also for us to bear in mind, that as yeah. important as Jerusalem is, and as unique as we consider our bond with the city to be, nevertheless, only one religion was actually born in this city, from which I'm speaking to you, and that's Christianity. So I think both Muslims and Jews actually would, uh, it's appropriate to bear that in mind. At any rate, with, regard, with regards to the question that you've directed to me, Lisa, I think we can say that we, are, we live in the golden age of Catholic Jewish relations. And, uh, and relations between the Holy See and the State of Israel have never been better. This doesn't mean that there aren't areas that need to be improved. And um, His Excellency has referred to the fact that we haven't concluded the fundamental agreement yet. Some more somewhat 25 or whatever years later, so that's still outstanding. Um, I would say that um, if you ask with regards to the situation of Christians, you asked in Israel, and that's interesting because we, I think it's important to bear in mind for our own edification that the situation in Israel is different from the situation in Jerusalem um, because the people in where the major Christian institutions are to be found in Jerusalem is in East Jerusalem. And there the general population sees itself as part and parcel of Palestinian society. And therefore the Christian population see themselves as part of that and therefore have an interest in being uh, esteemed and valued as part and parcel of Palestinian society. 
the vast majority of Christians in the Holy Land are in the Galilee. And of course, there are significant communities around Jaffa and Tel Aviv and even in the south of the country. Far larger amount of Christians within the state of Israel. These are citizens of the state of Israel. And their interests, yes, of course, they are the vast majority of them Arabs, or at least certainly the indigenous communities, but they have a vested interest in being understood and appreciated and esteemed by the Jewish majority within the state of Israel. By definition, this means that even if though they are part of one, if you like, ecclesial community, they have very diff different political attitudes and orientations. And the Christian communities within East Jerusalem, very much the vast majority of them seeing themselves as part of a society, namely Palestinian society, struggling for its place under the sun against Israel, see themselves as a struggle as opposed, a struggle opposed to Israel. Whereas the Christians who are in the state of Israel see themselves want to be accepted and respected as loyal citizens of the state. And this creates various areas of tension. Uh, the Holy See cannot ignore the fact that the Christian communities in Jerusalem are part of Palestinian society. And therefore it has to take into account their own pain, their own challenges that they face on a daily basis. And I think all things considered, it's quite remarkable how well those interests as well as its relationship with Israel are balanced. I think if you look at the positions of church leadership, Catholic church leadership within Israel, they have been generally far more responsible, certainly than those of some of the small Protestant minorities here. Uh, all in all, the Christian communities within Israel are a success story. Their graduation matriculation rights, uh, uh, results, uh, annual results are higher than the Jewish average. They qualify disproportionately in the professions and, uh, uh, and have a high socioeconomic standard. Not because everybody here loves Christians, I would like that to be the case, but we still got quite a way to go in that in terms of the burden of history, but simply because they're the beneficiaries of the democratic opportunities that Israeli society provides. Thank you. Thank you, David. Time is flying and I have loads of questions, uh, but we won't be able to get to them. So I will ask one last question before. I know that the, there are people in the audience who would like to ask questions, so I have to leave space for them. Uh, the other questions would that I can't ask right now, that maybe will come from the audience, uh, re re refer to Pius XII and the, and the uh, archives that have been opened and to uh, sustainable development, which is uh, a very important topic for Francis, but also for the Jewish community and uh, also um, diplomatic relations with Iran, uh, the threat of Iran to world peace and of Hezbollah, but I won't ask those now. Maybe somebody will in the audience, but I would like to ask one question, uh, which is regards the Declaration of Human Fraternity that was considered to be a highly significant document signed in Abu Dhabi last year by Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar. So Archbishop Gallagher, Jewish representative invited to join, and what steps are being taken to include the Jewish community in this initiative? And David, what is the state of Jewish-Muslim relations in Israel and in the diaspora? We'll have to, by the way, uh, we'll have to take five minutes for this so we can leave time for other questions, and I thank you. Uh, okay, um, I, you're quite right in saying that the uh, document signed between the Grand Imam and Pope Francis in Abu Dhabi was a very significant step um, in a desire to carry forward the objectives of that document on human fraternity. Uh, there has been established a higher committee uh, of human fraternity and as part of that high committee there has been uh, integrated uh, uh, Rabbi Bruce Lustig senior rabbi at Washington Hebrew Congregation. So he's going to participate in the future meetings and activities of that higher committee. And uh, we are obviously very uh, glad that the rabbi has accepted to be part of that and to carry forward the, the, the objectives there. It's at its uh, beginning stage, but I, I know that the Holy Father does attribute great importance uh, to uh, that document because I think it was in principally, because not only does it, was it an agreement between a very senior leader of the Muslim world, but also because he believes that this concept of 
of human fraternity is a common um, line running through uh, many of, shall we say, the hopes of uh, society and humanity for the future. And so to which obviously religious communities should be making a contribution. And indeed, I think it's a way for uh, Muslims and, and Christians, and now maybe on other religions as well, including uh, the Jewish community, to uh, really to work uh, on behalf of humanity to try and build a, a future of reduced conflict, of aspirations for peace, and really a recognition of our common humanity. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in that, obviously, uh, leaders of faith, people of faith are going to have and must make a very significant contribution. Uh, allow me to be able to follow up on the comment rather than respond to your question, which is such a broad one, and say that I was uh, myself very disappointed that there was no Jewish representative <clears throat> on stage with uh, His Holiness Pope Francis and the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, especially because the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar has not shown himself to be a very nice friend of the Jewish people and uh, has generally avoided even being present and being photographed with any Jewish person. That meant that this was a golden opportunity and in my opinion, it was a missed opportunity. I think it's wonderful that Rabbi Lustig is part of this higher committee, but that's not the same thing as the power of the visual image. I note that as opposed to his predecessors, two predecessors, Pope Francis has not himself convened any multi-faith event like the gathering in Assisi, um, which Pope Benedict did twice uh, and John Paul II did twice. And I would hope that there might be such an opportunity in which the uh, commitment of Pope Francis, which is beyond doubt, could nevertheless assume the visual symbolism that his predecessors gave to it and showing therefore that all the religion should be seen to be engaged with one another and not simply one taking advantage of you like the power or the profile of the other, especially if they are known to be rather dismissive of a relationship to a third or a fourth. So I do hope there'll be something a little bit further in that score, but may I say, that as far as Jewish, Christian, Muslim collaboration is concerned, there has never ever been as much as we have today. So with all the problems and all the difficulties, we seem to be, please God, moving in a very constructive direction. All right. Thank you both very much. We will interrupt now and turn this over to Daniel Silver and to the, the many listeners. Uh, I'm sure that there will be many questions for you coming from our AGC audience. Daniel. Thank you, Lisa. And as you noted, we have, we have many questions, especially on the, the topic of the archives. So our first question comes from Liat Ohana in Jerusalem, who asks, who says, scholarly research on the millions of documents related to Pius XII's papacy, now made available through the opening of the Vatican's formerly secret archives, was interrupted by the coronavirus pandemic. Once research resumes again, what are the Catholic and Jewish expectations for new revelations that will cast more light on this period? And is there any news regarding Pius's sainthood process? Uh, Archbishop Gallagher? Well, uh, the archives have uh, reopened from the, uh, I'm speaking for the archives of this uh, section for relations with states uh, only, uh, but I think the other archives are, are also open. But we're, we're from the 15th of June until the 15th of July, uh, because after the 15th of July, there is a summer recess uh, as occurs every year and uh, the number of uh, places normally we can we can accommodate 22 scholars every day at the moment because of the uh, requirements of distancing etc it's down to nine but the, um, the, the 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 it has begun and in fact uh, so far there have been a, I'm told that the 30 scholars have taken advantages of, of the possibilities in, in these uh, last uh, weeks um, our expectations for the study of the uh, documents, which two million documents, there's 323 linear meters of, uh, of shells. Uh, but of course, as you, as you pointed out, it's, it's all available uh, online, at least the, the first 10 years of the pontificate are completely available and the second 10 years are being uh, concluded 
in, 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 the, in this time, it'll still take a little while to get up to uh, 1958. Uh, uh, but our expectations are high. We believe that uh, it will be very enriching for uh, stu uh, stu study uh, students of that, a that era. Um, and we, we hope that it will do a lot to reveal the commitment of Pope Pius XII uh, to uh, doing what he, be what he believed he could do uh, for, the, for the Jewish uh, communities, uh, both here in Italy, in Rome, and throughout Europe. Um, with regard to his uh, possible beatification, there, there is no uh, new uh, information to share with our, our, our uh, viewers this afternoon. Um, let, let me say that I think that the, obviously the period of the, the Second World War, the period of the Shoah, is one of the most uh, complex and tragic of all periods. And obviously uh, Jews relate to it in a very particular way. Uh, let me also say, state the obvious and saying that for the Catholic Church, the Vatican and the Pope is not just another institution nor another guy. And therefore, obviously, the uh, Catholics will relate to the policies and approach of the institution and of the incumbent on the throne of St. Peter in a very special way. So we don't relate. This is what I was referring to earlier when talking about the difference in the way we approach historical memory. And I think it's really important for us to bear that in mind, because I don't think that no matter what the archives reveal, we will ever reach complete unanimity in our view of the historical record. I think there will always be the position taken by the, certainly by the, in the Holy See itself, that the Holy See and the Pope in particular tried their very best under very trying circumstances. I think for the Jewish community, the very idea that in the face of such enormity of tragedy, anything could be considered the very best other than perhaps martyrdom is almost uh, uh, indigestible. And therefore, I think it's important for us to recognize that there is not going to be a final agreement on the historical record. But I think that the access to the archival material is really important. First and foremost, it's a very significant demonstration of good faith. And the transparency is very important. And Pope Francis was very explicit about this. We're not scared of history. We've got nothing to hide. And therefore, if judgment is not complimentary, okay, let's face it. But if it is complimentary, then face that too. And so I think there is a desire to be able to know more what led up, what were the positions, what were agreements, what really was known when, what were the actions after the Second World War, what expressions of regret were there that more wasn't done, what collaboration was there with regards to people who were in fact Nazi war criminals. I think a lot of information will be revealed, but I don't think it's going to change the way we view the fundamental historical record. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ray Termini in Dallas, Texas. In 2015, the Vatican signed its first treaty with the state of Palestine calling for courageous decisions to end the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The treaty made official the Vatican's de facto recognition of Palestine since 2012. Archbishop, you said at the signing of the treaty that you hoped it would be a stimulus to bringing a definitive end to the long-standing Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Do you think that it has? And if so, how? If not, why not? Well, um, de facto, there is, there is not uh, a re renewed dialogue between Israel and Palestine. So uh, obviously what, what our hopes were on signing the agreement have, have not been fulfilled. This is, this is, this is correct. We, we keep trying. Um, obviously the rejection by the uh, Palestinians of uh, President Trump's uh, vision uh, plan for, for the future it does not help. We continue to reiterate, as we did only very recently in a press statement, um, that we is our, our desire to for that direct uh, dialogue to be uh, once again uh, the, the, the means to, and we believe it is an indispensable means. Third parties can help, third parties can encourage, but in the end it must be a decision between Israelis and Palestinians which will bring peace 
and bring uh, security to, to the region. So we, as, as ever, it, we, keep, we keep working. We would like, I think, some of the limits is, is to try and, and get that uh, dialogue uh, going again in some way. And I, I don't have any quick fix for that. We, we try to continue to engage both uh, with uh, Israel and uh, with uh, Palestine, but uh, it, it's, it's a very difficult moment, quite obviously. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lucas Peters in Brussels, and this is a topic I know on the minds of a lot of our, of our viewers today. Amongst the many threats to world peace, Iran's pursuit of regional hegemony and its menace to Israel's existence are among the top concerns. Iran continues to destabilize the Middle East by using Shia militia to coerce governments, army Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis, continuing to work on its nuclear ambitions, heightening tensions in a highly volatile and strategically vital region, and is guilty of major human rights violations. So Archbishop Gallagher, what should be done to compel Iran to comply with international norms? Well, I think a lot of people are trying to compel uh, Iran to uh, comply um, and uh, not making a great deal of progress. Uh, we have been uh, supportive both during its negotiations and uh, throughout its operation of this uh, nuclear agreement, the JCPOA. We uh, regret that uh, the United States withdrew from that. We tried to encourage the, that not to happen. And we've tried to encourage uh, Iran also to remain within uh, the uh, commitments that they made to the International Atomic Agency and to the other signatories uh, to that agreement. Uh, we also uh, believe, uh, well, we, 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 in our discussions with Iranian uh, uh, colleagues and representatives, we do say that there is a need to abandon uh, such uh, statements such as which do not recognize uh, the existence of, of the State of Israel. And we also say that we believe that there is a need for significant gestures on behalf of Iran uh, to help contribute to a, uh, shall we say, pacification or a moving forward to greater peace throughout the region, which would particularly uh, in regard to Iraq and, uh, and to uh, Syria. So we try to do uh, what we can in that, in that respect. And we uh, do believe at the same time that Iran is a very significant uh, player it, that requires to be engaged in also in a, a respectful way, while at the same time in a, in a realistic way. So we, we, we try to make contribution uh, at that level. And uh, we uh, understand that, uh, that, that Iran is perceived by others in, in, in an extremely uh, negative way. Thank you. We have time for a few more questions. Our next question comes from Janice Ellen in, in Atlanta, who asks you, Arch, Archbishop Gallagher, that you rightly point out that interreligious dialogue needs to be deepened for better understanding. Can you share what individual dioceses are doing to foster these efforts towards defeating ignorance? Well, I think it depends where you are and what, what your particular situation and, and the resources that you have. I think many um, dioceses um, have, uh, you know, commissions for interreligious dialogue. I think it depends largely on the composition of the wider society in which a particular Catholic community is living. If you, if you don't have significant non-Christian groups, uh, then you're, you're much more, less likely to take initiatives. But I think where there are uh, large communities, I think the, the church is active in dialogue. I think the difficult, the, obviously groups come together to face uh, common uh, social and maybe even political problems which they face in society as people of faith. But I, I, I really do believe that there is a need for that dialogue to be also, to be truly interreligious in which people do share the, the depths uh, and the the detail of their faith and can witness to their faith to others who may be not of that faith. So I, I think we, in some ways we have to try and deepen that, that experience to understand uh, the riches of the faiths of others, which I think enable us in the end to understand our, our own faith in a much better way and to live it in a much more coherent and consistent way. May I, may I just add 
add a comment on, on that. I, 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 just to reinforce the comment, uh, where there are vibrant Catholic and Jewish communities alongside one another, that's where the Olympian heights are translated into action in the, on the grassroots and in terms of the communities. And the United States or North America is unique in that respect. There is nowhere in the world where the transformation in terms of the Catholic Church's approach to Jews and Judaism has been internalized and actualized as much as in the relationship between the churches and the Jewish communities in the North America, in the United States in particular. In fact, there is a network of centers for Christian Jewish studies, which I think is on 30 or 40 institutions, and almost all of them except for two are in the United States, which shows the total imbalance in that regard. Of course, Israel is a different situation because of the small number of Christians here. And anyway, uh, the origins of the Jewish community are a little more complex as well as the daily challenges. But that's precisely the point. The vast majority of Catholics in the world are in places where there are no vibrant Jewish communities, where the vast of the majority never encounter a Jew, where their only images of Jews in most cases are taken from the stereotypical negative past. That's why it's so important that the Holy See is engaged here. You can't just rely on the local communities. There needs to be directive to the churches, even where there are no Jews, to be able to take the relationship of the church to its Jewish roots and the need to be able to combat anti-Semitism and distortions and perversions in the way Jews and Judaism are viewed more seriously, or at least, if I should say, more actively. Uh, if I may add a few words, I think that the, uh, unfortunately, the common stereotypes, the simple stereotypes persist somehow, despite everything. And uh, I know that the experience of the Bishop's Conference in it, uh, of uh, relations with Jews, uh, it, it, people report that the people who go to parish churches are inevitably amazed when they say Jesus was a Jew. They, some, of, some of the people are even shocked. They say, how can that be? So it, it, there's a lot of work to be done. And, and I think that the problem is also goes beyond the Catholic Church uh, and, and beyond the relations with, direct relations with Jews, because there are so many groups, fanatic groups in the world today that are uh, propagating anti-Semitic stereotypes and how do we reach them? I think that's a big problem. How do we reach them? Uh, and this goes back to the uh, agreement that says anywhere, anytime, to anyone. So it's not just to Catholics that we have to reach out. We have to reach out to the world around us, I think. So I think that's a big problem and I, I just wonder how that can, that can be faced. Thank you, Lisa. Our, our last question, before, we have, before I turn it back over to you, Lisa, to conclude, comes from Pat Patricia Block in Potomac, Maryland, who asks, as America struggles with our own history of racism, are there any lessons to be learned from some of the Catholic Church's own wrestling with its own history? Archbishop? Well, um, I think I can say that uh, the Catholic Church wrestles and always will wrestle with, with our history. Um, at the same time, I, I, I believe that we have to be, as uh, Rabbi David was saying earlier, that we have to, in some ways, uh, accept ourselves before we can uh, accept the others. Um, I, th I think that, that is, that is the, the key to it, is to approach uh, our history in as objective a way as we can. Now, Obviously, there is no, no thing as pure history or pure fact, and that it always comes through, is it, it comes through and is interpreted uh, via a lens. But I think we have to encourage ourselves to accept that. That's why I think it's, it's, it's no, no point in going back and trying to correct history. We have to face up to what happened, even why it happened, and to accept, accept the, the responsibility in the sense that it is the responsibilities of our forefathers in, in, in the faith, and to ourselves learn of, from uh, the, the mistakes of the past and try uh, in, in some ways not to forget. And I think that that is you know, one of the key elements in, in, in the, you know, the 
Holocaust remembrance movements that there is a danger that we will forget, that humanity will forget, that history could, could forget. And we too, in, in many aspects of our, of our life of the, of the Catholic Church, we come under uh, considerable pressure on things that, uh, uh, that the contemporary uh, opinion considers to be wrong. Um, and you're, we, have to, we have to accept that. So I think that people who are now in the United States, for example, uh, facing up to the history of race relations in the, in the United States and in North America in general, I think then you have to be just be prepared to to go in and uh, read it as it was and uh, to accept that uh, yes it wasn't all glory lisa i'm going to turn it back over to you since we're just nearing the end okay i just first of all i i want to thank you both very much for this in-depth really discussion and um uh, I, I'm sure there's so much more to be said, and I hope we will be able to continue at some point in the near future and under some form or other. And I think especially the discussion about the archives in Pius XII, it was very helpful, your contributions, because it changes the issue to a black and white issue and uh, permits the emergence of all the complexity of the times uh, during the war, but also after the war which has not been investigated, I think, enough because nothing was said for years during the end, the, the remaining years of the papacy about the Holocaust. And there are questions that can be related to that. So thank you both so much, very much. And um, until the next time then, alla prossima, as they say in Italy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for that fascinating conversation. I also wanna thank our audience for joining us and for showing your commitment to the topics discussed here today. In these unique times, while so many of us are separated from our family and friends, AJC is still bringing us together on the issues that matter. Please consider making a donation to AJC so we can offer you more programs like this one and so we can continue building closer ties with other faith and ethnic communities and confronting common challenges. Visit ajc.org slash donate. Our next Advocacy Anywhere program will feature a conversation with Rabbi Delphine Orguleur, France's foremost female rabbi, for a wide-ranging discussion on the intersection of racism and anti-Semitism, the role of religion in times of crisis, and the importance of building bridges between people and communities where dialogue and understanding are often missing. This program will take place tomorrow, Thursday, July 9th, at 12, or sorry, Thursday, July 9th, 12 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. I hope you will join us. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Archbishop Gallagher. Thank you, Rabbi Rosen, and thank you, Lisa. Please stay safe and healthy, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. God bless.